My topic tonight is Journey to Eternity, What is Heaven Really Like? Let's begin our journey in Egypt this evening. We've traveled to Egypt on a number of times during this lecture series. We've usually paused to admire the wonder and the splendor of the pyramids not far from Cairo out there in the deserts of Giza. But tonight we travel further than that. We travel from these pyramids down to the Valley of the Kings. It's in the early 1920s and Howard Carter is looking for the tomb of the boy king Tutankhamun. He's worked in the Valley of the Kings for a number of years. His money has run out and he's gone back to England to Lord Carnarvon, his patron and financier, to beg and plead for a little more money so he can keep digging and excavating. Lord Carnarvon agrees to finance the expedition for one more season. And it's during that last season of digging in late 1922 that Howard Carter comes across what he believes to be is the entrance to the tomb of King Tutankhamun. Howard Carter is ecstatic. He senses that he has found the tomb. But there's one question in his mind. Have grave robbers gotten there ahead of him? And is the tomb empty? As he enters down the staircase with hands almost trembling, he comes to the door of the tomb and he finds that it's sealed. He will not open it unless, he sin unless Lord Carnarvon, his financier and patron, is there with him. On February 16, 1923, Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter the Explorer open these doors. And as they do, they stand in wonder, amazement, and awe. In fact, Howard Carter is so stunned that he can't say anything at all. Here are his words. At first, I could see nothing. The hot air escaping from the chamber, causing the candle flame to flicker. But presently, as my eyes grew accustomed to the lights, details of the room within emerged slowly from the midst. Strange animals, statues, and gold everywhere, the glitter of gold. Howard Carter was stunned. He was absolutely amazed. And then, listen as he continues describing what happened next. For a moment, in eternity it must have seemed to others standing by, I was struck dumb with amazement. And when Lord Carter inquired anxiously, can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words, yes, wonderful things. The world had never seen treasures like that before. The world had never seen treasures like King Tutankhamun's tomb before. As Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon entered into that tomb, they saw the, to their amazement and wonder, they saw the nest of seven coffins that King Tutankhamun was buried in. These coffins overlaid with pure gold. Some of the wonders of the world. As they began examining these artifacts from a distant past, they noted the magnificence and the splendor. Here is the intermediate coffin. Notice the boy king's face. Now, the Egyptians believed in what was called the Ba and the Ka. The Egyptians believed that the Ba left the body at death, but later would come back seeking after what they called was some kind of immortal spirit, the Ka. Of course, this is not biblical, but found in ancient Egyptology. The reason the artists made the face of the image to look so much like the original person was because they had the idea that when the Ba came back looking for the Ka, 
It wanted to find the right person, and it wouldn't find them unless the face represented in the death mask looked exactly like the person's face. And so when you look at the detail of the face here in this picture, here is the boy king. And Tutankhamun probably looked like that and probably resembled that death mask and that, that face. Tutankhamun's third coffin is made of solid hammered gold and weighs about 450 pounds. Just think of it, solid gold, 450 pounds of it. The death mask, of course, was gold as well. You cannot put a value on something like Tutankhamun's death mask. It's not worth a million dollars. It's not worth a hundred million. It's, it's, you can't put a price on it. It is indeed priceless. In addition to these death masks that were found, there are 143 priceless jewels placed on King Tutankhamun's body. Jewels that are of inestimable value. Think of the wealth. Think of the gold. Think of the splendor. Here is an amulet to be worn around the neck, a pendant from Horus the hawk god representing him. But every one of these are just inlaid jewels, absolutely spectacular, of inestimable value. Here is a crook and a flail that was used in ancient Egypt for King Tutankhamun. Solid gold again. When you look at what was found there, a pure gold dagger. Gold was used so lavishly in ancient Egypt and particularly in King Tutankhamun's tomb. We stand in awe. We stand in wonder. We stand in amazement. You look at one of six chariots found there in that tomb. Again, wheels and body of the chariot overlaid with gold. It just takes your breath away, and it goes on and on and on. Not hundreds, but thousands of golden objects found. This is a ceremonial sailing boat for use supposedly to the voyage to the next world. It is made and overlaid with gold. Can you see why Howard Carter said, I see wonderful things, gold lavishly used. Here's King Tutankhamun's throne. And again, look at the careful detail. If we look at it even a little closer up, you notice the artwork, the overlaying with gold. When you think about King Tutankhamun's treasures, you say to yourself, if you think Tutankhamun's treasures are pretty fantastic, wait till you see what heaven is like. If indeed they use gold there, why God has so much gold up in heaven, he uses it to pave streets. <laughs> King Tutankhamun's tomb is nothing in comparison to the glories that God is going to show us in the new world. Think of the foundations of that city with the varied jewels, the amethyst and the crystallite, and you think of the, the emerald, the sapphires. I mean, God's holy city has gates with pearls in each gate, one pearl for each gate. Here, the golden gleaming city of the living God makes King Tutankhamun's treasures look like they are worth a penny or a half a cent if there is such a thing because God's capital is far more spectacular and far more glorious. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, read it together with me. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. Your eyes have never behold, beheld something so spectacular. You've never seen something so fantastic. King Tutankhamun's treasures do not hold a candle to what God has prepared for us. Eye has not seen. More beautiful than any magnificent sunset. More magnificent, more glorious, more beautiful than the most magnificent flower garden. More God's holy city is more beautiful than anything we can conceive or imagine. The Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard. It's more fantastic than the greatest symphony, more amazing than the most 
too finely tuned and professional orchestra. Heaven is beyond our wildest dreams. Heaven is beyond our most fantastic imagination. But what is heaven really like? Will we be disembodied spirits? Will my wife float by heaven as some feathery cloud or some mist? And will I float by the other side of heaven as some mist, some vapor, some kind of spirit being? And will I go beep, beep? And will she go beep, beep? And will we be pass as clouds in the night? And will I say, is that you, darling? <laughs> Will we be able to recognize one another in heaven? What is heaven really, really going to be like? You know, in the United States Treasury Building in Washington, D.C., I am told that the Treasury Building that, uh, ha that holds the wealth of America or the, uh, the wealth in its hand, I'm told that this Treasury Building has 1,800 doors, but there is one key that unlocks all 1,800 doors. There is one key that will unlock the mystery about the door of heaven. The mystery that unlocks the treasures of heaven. There's a key that will unlock that door. It's a biblical key. And if you understand that biblical key, you can understand what heaven is really like. And here it is in two significant passages in the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Nevertheless, we according to his promise. God has made a what? Promise. And there's one thing God can't do and that's lie. Look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So here's the key to understanding heaven. Heaven is not some make-believe world. Heaven is not some world of disembodied spirits. The Bible says God's going to create a new heaven and a new what? Earth. So heaven is a very real place. The gar it's like the Garden of Eden recreated again. When God created the Garden of Eden, he did not desire that this world be plunged into sin. And so God has a new heavens and a new earth that he'll create. Revelation 21 verse 1, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. So the key in understanding heaven is understanding that after the coming of Christ, after the thousand years millennium that we studied last evening, the holy city descends and God recreates a new heaven and a new earth like it would have been had this world not been defiled by sin. It's no make-believe place. It's no fairy tale place. We don't have disembodied spirit bodies. It's a real place for real people with glorious immortal bodies who do real activities in a real new heavens and a new earth. The Bible describes these worthies of faith down through the ages that look forward to this new heavens and new earth. The Bible describes this plan of God to restore Eden to earth. When we look back at the Garden of Eden, its air was pure, its brooks were crystal and clear, its fruit trees blossomed, and Adam and Eve walked hand in hand through that garden. They experienced joy and gladness. And the Bible says that once again, Isaiah 35 verse 1, the wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Once again, this earth, so tarnished, so deteriorated, so defiled, so devastated by sin, this earth, the Bible says, will be recreated into Edenic splendor again. Once again, we'll live the Eden life. Once again, joy and gladness will hold hands and walk through the land. Once again, love and peace will be partners and walk through the land. Once again, just like Adam and Eve walked and talked in that garden with God, once again, we will see him face to face. Once again, we'll fellowship with him down through the ages. The sad drama of sin will be over. And the promise of God that he held out to the royal line of faith will be fulfilled. The sorrow of the past, the, the heartache of the past will be gone. Down through the ages there has been a royal line of faith. And these men and women of faith have looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the first time. They looked forward to the second coming of Christ the second time. But they looked beyond all that to the day that the sad drama of sin would be over and the day that heaven would take place and the holy city would descend. The Bible says, Hebrews 11 verse 10, read it with me please. For he waited for the city 
which has foundations, whose builder and maker is what? Builder and maker is God. There is a city that's coming whose builder and maker is God. The worthies of faith look down through the ages for that city, and we look down through the ages tonight for that city. Down through the centuries, men and women of faith have looked forward with hope-filled hearts to their journey into eternity. There's one thing for certain. This world is not our home. There's one thing that burns in my soul. I know. There are many things I do not know. But I know for sure that there's a better land coming. I know for sure that this world is not our home. This world is not our home when terrorists board buses with their explosive laden vests and blow up those buses and kill innocent men, women, and children. Deep in my heart I know this world is not our home. This world is not our home when terrorists attack this week a hotel in Mumbai in India and innocent people are killed. There's something wrong with that picture. Deep in my heart, I know it. There must be something better. This world is not our home when children die of brain cancer too young. This world is not our home. Deep in my heart, my heart cries out for something better. This world is not our home when young people lie in back alleys and shoot drugs in their veins and destroy their minds and bodies with mind-altering drugs and cocaine and ecstasy. This world is not my home. There must be something better than our youth living fruitless lives, meaningless lives, and dying in back alleys. God has something better. This world is not our home. When Husbands and wives must say goodbye because the husband or wife died of cancer. God must have something better than cancer and heart disease and suffering. God must have something better than divorce and heartache and sorrow and disappointment and loneliness. Deep within your heart, I know you feel it. Deep within your heart, I know you sense it. Deep within your heart you know you were created for something better. You were made for something better than loneliness and sorrow and sickness and death. You were made for something better than aging and going into the grave and never coming out. God's plan is so much better than this. I know this world is not our home. When the headlines feature tornadoes and cyclones and cities are destroyed and devastated, God must have something better than this. I know this world is not my home. When I travel through Africa and I travel through India and I see babies with distended bellies because they've been starving and they cry out for food, I know this world is not my home. One night I was leaving a meeting in Rwanda and I left the meeting that evening. In the darkness, there were many orphans. They were running the streets. And as I went to step in the car to take me home, a young boy ran out of the darkness with many other orphans. And he grabbed me by the legs. And he said, Mister, I'm an orphan of the streets. I have no daddy. Would you be my daddy? And I knelt down on the ground. And I looked this boy in the eye, and many other orphans gathered round. I knew that whatever I did, I could never solve the problem that these kids had. And I hugged that boy, and I pointed up to the stars, and I said, son, son, there's a daddy better than me. He's a loving heavenly father. And never forget in your life that one day you have a home beyond the stars. This world, young man, is not your home. Deep within your heart, grasp it, reach out to it. There is a better world coming. There is a better world coming. A world beyond what our eyes can see. One day that holy city will descend. You were made for something better. You were created for something better. You were created by the living God. One day that holy city will descend. And the Bible says in Revelation 21 verse 2, that I, John, saw the holy city. New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. 
the, John says this is a spectacular event. And he says, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. What's the tabernacle of God? The dwelling place of God. And he will be with them and be their people. And he will be with them and they shall be his people. The Bible says they shall be the, his people. God himself shall be with them and be their God. The holy city descends. And as it descends, a loud voice comes and it says, Behold, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God is with men. And women, God comes to be with his people. Now look, the earth revolves around the sun. The sun in the solar system is revolving around a cosmic center. There are multiple planetary systems with stars and galaxies, and astronomers tell us that they all move and they go around one cosmic center. That cosmic center is the throne of God. From God's throne, God's tabernacle, God says to the sun rise and it rises. He says to the sun set and it sets. God sets in motion the laws that say to the tides of the sea, you can come here, but you cannot come any further. God orders the stars and the planets. God orders the destiny and the rise and fall of nations. God from his cosmic control center at the heart of the universe commands it all. But wait! A solemn voice comes from heaven. The holy city begins to descend, and God's tabernacle comes to earth. And as it does, there is an announcement, and the announcement says, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with man. The cosmic control center of the universe, the command center of the universe moves, and the holy city descends, and this earth, this planet in rebellion, this planet in rebellion, God creates a new heavens and a new earth. He takes this earth so pock-marked with sin, so devastated with destruction, he makes it over again, and he makes earth his dwelling place. And from this earth, the whole universe is commanded, and we travel with God from star to star to planet to planet. We travel with him to vast civilizations untainted by sin. We are princes and princesses. We sit on the throne with Jesus. We're his honor convoy through the whole universe. Do not throw away your heritage. Do not throw away your heritage. The world has nothing to offer. You are a prince. You are a princess. One day you'll travel from galaxy to galaxy. You will share God's grace. You'll share his love. You'll share his mercy because we have a testimony to tell unfallen worlds about the grace of God and how he picked us up from the guttermost and led us to the uttermost. He led us from the depths of despair to the delights of discipleship. He led us from where we were to where he is, don't sell out cheap for a few tawdry pleasures of this world. You are a prince. You are a princess. You have royal blood running through your veins. The Bible says the holy city descends to a remade earth. It's the most festive event in the entire universe, singing praises to Jesus Christ forever and ever. The Bible says, Revelation 21, verse 12 and 13, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The gates, 12 gates. The Bible says the names of the 12 tribes of Israel, three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. Why three on the north, three on the south, three on the east, three on the west? Three symbolizes the Holy Spirit, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. On the east, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit say, the gates are open, come in. On the west, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit say, the gates are open, come in. On the north, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit say, come in. South, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit say, come in. The gates are wide open for you. What about the names of Israel on those gates? Wait a minute now. Who are the names of the tribes of Israel? Reuben, Simeon, Levi. They were murderers. They were, if you tried them in Orlando or any state in the United States where you're watching, if you tried the sons of Levi, they could be tried for murder, robbery, adultery. Why are their names on the gates? To testify to you and me that any man or woman that accepts the grace of Jesus Christ can walk through those gates. Amen. They were sinners redeemed by grace. The Bible says now the wall of the city had 12 foundations. 
And on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Who were the 12 apostles? James and John, the sons of thunder. Peter, who denied him. Thomas, who betrayed him. These names indicate that they were sinners saved by grace. These followers of Christ were people with their faults, but their names are on the foundations of the holy city. Why? Why were their names on the foundations of that holy city? Because God is saying to us, if they can make it, so can we. You can enter in through the gates into that city. Heaven's goal is to get as many people in as possible. When I look at myself, I see no possibility to be saved. But when I look at Jesus, I see no possibility to be lost. Jesus will get you in if you surrender your life to him. He has never lost a case. God is saying, whoever you are, you can make it through those gates. Whatever you've done, his grace can forgive you. Whatever you've failed in, his grace can transform your life. He can make you into a new man. He can make you in to a new woman. The Bible says he measured the city with the reed. 12,000 furlongs its length, breadth, and height are equal. What's that? 12,000 furlongs. The Bible says a city of 12,000 furlongs would be 375 miles on one side. You talk about space, a city with 375 miles on one side. We had one mathematician estimate how big that would be, and he estimated that the New Jerusalem could house 2 billion people just on the ground floor. But if we use magnificent multi-story luxury buildings, the possibilities are endless. There is room for you. There is room for you. The Bible says the 12 gates, Revelation 21, 21, were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Every gate is a pearl. Jesus Christ, the pearl of great price, swings open those gates for you. You can be there. The city is so valuable because you are so valuable. In that marriage supper of the Lamb, God is looking down that golden table for you. And if your seat is empty, he doesn't have a cosmic photocopy machine to photocopy you. He's looking for you. He'll be disappointed if you're not there. There's a place in his heart only for you. I don't want to disappoint Jesus. I don't want Jesus looking for me and to miss heaven. It's one thing to miss the bus. It's another thing to miss the train. It's another thing to miss your ride, but it's another thing to miss heaven. You don't want to miss heaven. Whatever it takes, surrender your life to him and say, Jesus, I want to be there for you forever. Now, what's going to be our physical condition in this new earth? Yes, the holy city descends. Yes, the earth is made over again in Edenic splendor. Yes, there's a new heavens and a new earth. But what kind of bodies will we have? Well, the Bible describes it. It tells us. It's very clear. No guesswork. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Our citizenship is in heaven. I'm not a citizen here. Somebody, I'm walking through town. Somebody says, where are you going? I say, I'm going to heaven. I'm just passing through Orlando. Uh, <laughs> for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior. And then the Bible says, the Lord Jesus Christ will transform our lowly body, our mortal lowly body, that it may be conformed to his what? Glorious body. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he had a glorious body. Now, in that glorious body, was he recognized when he came out of the grave? Well, Mary recognized him by his voice, voice intonation. He called Mary when she wondered if he was the gardener. Immediately, she recognized him. So he was recognizable to Mary when he appeared to the apostles. They recognized him. They knew it was their Savior and Lord. Even in his glorious body, he was no different. I mean, he was a glorious body, certainly. But he was recognizable. They knew it was Jesus. The disciples on the Emmaus Road had their eyes holding. The Bible says when he talked to them, but when then, then at supper, when he broke bread, they recognized him and they knew that it was Jesus by his unique mannerisms. So let's summarize. Will we recognize one another in heaven? Sure we will. How will we recognize one another? By our unique mannerisms. You have a unique personality. 
God wants to save you. He's not going to totally transform you if he wanted to do that. Why would he have made you so special in the first place? So he's going to preserve your unique personality. What makes you you is going to be preserved in heaven. There'll be unique mannerisms. You'll have a unique voice intonation. You'll have unique... Uh, you'll have an individual personality, and you'll be physically recognizable just like Jesus was physically recognizable. We'll have a glorious immortal body. As we eat of the tree of, knowledge, of, of, of life, and as we eat of the fruits every month, we will grow. So we'll be, when we are resurrected, we will have glorious immortal bodies. But you know, Adam's gonna be quite different than me. Adam is probably, I don't know, twice as tall as people now living. He may be 15, 16 feet tall. Adam comes out of the grave muscular, you know, and I come out of the grave, well. <laughs> I mean, come on, why did you laugh? I mean, <laughs> Adam and I are going to look a little differently, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, I saw you there over there too, sir. You don't look so great yourself. <laughs> We come out of the grave. We have glorious immortal bodies, but we participate in partaking the fruit that comes every month, and we grow up to what we would have been. I mean, sir, if you think your wife looks beautiful now, wait till you see her in that resurrected glorious body. If you think your husband looks pretty good now, wait till you see him then, you see. We receive these glorious immortal bodies. The Bible says, Isaiah 33, verse 24, the inhabitant will not say I'm sick. The people who dwell in it will be forgiven their iniquity. No more cancer, no more heart disease. The Bible says we will not have sickness anymore. That's pretty exciting, isn't it? No more pain. The eyes of the blind will be open. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame man shall leap as a deer and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. The eyes of the blind are open. Here we have deaf translation. One day your ears will be opened and maybe the first words you hear if you've not heard from birth will be the words of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that be pretty exciting? The first words our deaf folk hear are the words of the living Christ when he says, well done thou good and faithful servant. The eyes of the blind open. The eyes of the the ears of the deaf unstopped, the withered man arm healed. We leap, we run, we rejoice because all of sickness and sorrow is gone. Our bodies are filled with vitality. Somebody said, Pastor Mark, you preach seven times today. Do you ever get tired? Somebody asked me that the other day. I was out in the lobby and said, you ever get tired? I said, yeah, I did once, but I didn't like it, so I'm not gonna do it anymore. <laughs> you see, in heaven, Vitality flows through your body. Somebody defined aging this way. They said aging is when you kneel down to tie your shoe and you say, what else can I do when I'm down here? <laughs> In heaven, a new life flows through your body. It is a new body with a new life. You know, for many years, I taught Bible at a crippled children's home. I met Joan Herman and she changed my life. She was a godly woman, she had polio. She got polio when she was 17 years old, bulbar polio, she was paralyzed from her neck down. And uh, she couldn't brush her teeth, couldn't comb her hair, couldn't button her blouse. My wife and I often would go and study the Bible with her and Tini would feed her, you know, and we'd feed her. And Joan would lie in her iron lung. Occasionally she could come out of the iron lung, but with polio she was paralyzed from her neck down and so her lungs didn't function, her hands didn't function, her feet didn't function, couldn't walk. And she had a stand above her bed rigged up. And she would look at her Bible, memorize page after page, and turn the pages of the Bible with her tongue. She memorized hundreds of texts in the Bible, and I would go there and she'd say, Pastor Mark, I'm studying the Bible with this nurse, this doctor, this state official. I'm studying the Bible with these people. And the third drawer down the bottom of my desk, pull out, there's 25 Bible lessons. You read the questions and uh, tell me what they wrote down for text, because I've memorized every single text and uh, I will uh, tell you if the texts are right or wrong or not. Occasionally, three hours a day, she would be put on a portable lung and she'd be let out of her uh, iron lung. I remember going there and uh, studying the Bible with her. You can see this picture was taken just a couple years ago. But, um, <laughs> but I remember going there 
and studying the Bible with Joni. And we'd study together. She'd be out of her iron lung for three hours in the day. She had a vision, and her vision was, and I don't mean some vision at night, a dream in her mind. Her dream was to establish a comprehensive community for physically handicapped people. And she did that. There were young people there. My wife and I would go Sabbath afternoon after Sabbath afternoon and study the Bible with them. And, it, and we came, and I'd study with Joni, and I'd study with Felicity, and uh, her head would be cocked to the side. She had cerebral palsy. Little Jimmy would come on a board, and he'd pull himself along that board with wheels on the board. And there would be Doris. Doris was blind and couldn't see. And Doris was dumb and couldn't speak. And Doris was crippled and couldn't walk, and they'd wheel her in on her bed, and the only faculty she had was her hearing. And we'd sing a song, Doris, you can smile when you can't say a word. You can smile when you cannot be heard. You can smile any time, anywhere. Doris, this is your song, and she'd smile. And I'd say, Jimmy, what do you want me to teach today? And he'd come in on his board, you know, he was crippled, no legs, and he'd say, Pastor, teach us about heaven today. And I'd say to Felicity, Felicity, what do you want us to teach today? Teach us about heaven, Pastor. I'd say, Joni, what do you want us to teach heaven? I'd say, wait a minute, I taught you guys heaven last week. And they would say, Pastor, teach us again because we forgot. Teach us again because we forgot. If you're watching this telecast and you're an unbeliever, what are you going to say to Jimmy who's on the board with no legs? Are you going to say, too bad, Jimmy? What are you going to say to Joni, who was paralyzed in an iron lung for 21 years until she was 38, and at 38 she got cancer and died? What are you going to say to her when she's dying? What are you going to say to Felicity, doomed to a life of cerebral palsy? You're just going to say, too bad? I'll tell you what I'm going to say. I'm going to hold Jimmy in my arms. I'm going to say, Jimmy, I know life is tough, but there's a better world coming. You may suffer for 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 70 years, but I want to tell you about a million trillion years because deep in my soul, I know it's true. Deep in my soul, I sense its reality. We are made for something better. We're not made for disease and suffering and death. God has a better world for you. Don't throw it away, my friend. It's just not worth it. Don't throw it away. We too need to hear it over and over and over again because we tend to forget Jesus is making a new heavens. Jesus is making a new earth. The Bible says God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more what? Death or sorrow or crying. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. The Bible says that we will no longer get phone calls at one o'clock in the morning saying your son, your daughter's just been killed in a car accident. Death is a thing of the past. The Bible says in Revelation 21, read it with me, there shall be no more what? Pain, for the former things are passed away. Beyond what our eyes can see, beyond what our ears can hear, the holy city will descend. The heavens will be made new again. The earth made new. Violence will be no more. War will be no more. The weapons of war will be put down. And the Bible says, Isaiah 11, verse 9, they shall not hurt, nor destroy it all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as waters of the sea. Echoing and re-echoing from every mountain and every valley will be worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive blessing and honor and glory forever and ever and ever and ever. We gather round the throne of God. We worship Jesus. Our hearts are filled with love and peace. We've never felt so accepted. We've never felt so loved. The one who knows us best loves us most. Heaven is a real place for real men and women with real bodies. Heaven is a real place for real activities. The Bible says, Isaiah 65, verse 17, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former will not be remembered or come to mind. Real bodies, vitality, energy, health, to live in a real new heavens and a new earth. The Bible says they'll build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit of them. The bank of heaven will never go broke to foreclose on your mansion in heaven. You'll never have to worry about house payments there. You can build your dream home in the country and have a city home in the holy city. Your dream home can overlook a valley with a beautiful brook running through it. 
all the great minds of the ages who are committed Christians will be there to help you design your dream home. And if necessary, the community of love and faith will help you to build it. The Bible says they'll build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Now, we look at the fruits of this earth, and we think these oranges look pretty good until God gives us an orange the size of a basketball that an entire family can feast on. These oranges are sprayed. These oranges are deteriorated by sin down through the ages. But God's orange trees will be have oranges the size of basketballs and one banana may feed an entire family for a half a week for all I know. The Bible says they shall not build and another inhabit, they shall not plant and another eat, for as the days of a tree shall be the days of my people. Putting your hands in the soil, growing your own crops, eating luxurious food from your own garden, worshiping Jesus, fellowshipping with the angels. What a day that is going to be. Mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their what? Hands together. You know, when my wife and I have a little time off, for many years we had a garden. We're looking forward to the time when we don't travel as much and we have that garden again and growing our green beans and growing our tomatoes and growing our corn. But in heaven, Jesus says, you'll be gardeners. Imagine looking at the abundance of that fruit in your own very backyard. But the most amazing thing about heaven is fellowship and friends. You know, in, in my life, I travel a great deal. And because I travel so much, it's hard to establish deep-rooted friendships when you're in a place five weeks and you're gone in a series like this. You know, I'm here and my wife and I are at the door and we greet people and we try to learn people's names and somebody says, did you sign my book? Sure. Can I take a picture? Sure. Somebody else comes by, I got a question here. And you know, we're back and forth and you travel a great deal and we just get to know people and we're gone. The wonderful thing about heaven is relationships. The wonderful thing about heaven, you know, the Bible puts it this way, Matthew 8, verse 11, and I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and they will sit down, not run by speedily, sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of what? Heaven. We are going to fellowship with the Bible greats down through the ages. We are going to sit down with them. I imagine that one day I'm walking down the golden streets of glory, and I see a man, and as I walk by him, I say, Hello, sir, it's a wonderful day in eternity. And he says, Yes, it's a wonderful day. I say, My name's Pastor Mark. What's your name? Moses. <laughs> I look twice. Are you? Yeah, I'm Moses. I wrote the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Moses, you got time for me? What do you mean do I have time for you? It's eternity. we got all the time in the world. <laughs> and so Moses and I sit down, and I say, Moses, what was it like when the Red Sea opened? Were you afraid? He said, look, I'm a human being. I had fear. But fear means fear is only bad if it paralyzes you. Sure, I had, my stomach was in knots when I put my foot in the water, but by faith I stepped forward in spite of my feelings. And Moses and I talk for much of the morning. I'm walking a little further on another day, and I see another man. Hi, I'm Pastor Mark. Oh, hi, I'm Daniel. You're, you're Daniel? I wrote a seminar about you. <laughs> and Daniel and I sit down together and we talk about the lion's den. He shares the miracles of God's grace. And then one day, I meet a man by the name of Paul. And Paul says, can we talk? And we sit down. I said, tell me what it was like to preach in Ephesus. Tell me what it was like to lead people to Christ and see them baptized. And Paul tells me his story. Then he says, Mark, I understand that you had a meeting in Orlando. It was satellited. I never dreamed of satellites in my day, Mark. I preached in Ephesus. But you preached at end time. God called me to preach in the first century, Mark, but he called you to preach in the 21st century. 
Tell me what it was like in Orlando. Tell me the struggles that people went through. Tell me the decisions they made. Tell me the ones that came down the aisle. Tell me the ones that walked through the water. And I share with Paul your story and your story and your story. And I share with him about what happened via satellite. And Paul's heart is thrilled and he said, introduce me to some of those people. I don't want to miss those moments in heaven for anything. What about you? I want to be there with Moses and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the Apostle Paul. But one day, one day, it's Sabbath. It's Sabbath in heaven. And the Bible says, Isaiah 66, verse 23, from one Sabbath to the other in the new heavens and the new earth, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. If we're going to worship him up there on Sabbath, don't you think we ought to be worshiping him every Sabbath down here? If we're going to praise him up there on Sabbath, don't you think we ought to be praising him down here every Sabbath? And we come to church on Sabbath. And God the Father stands up and introduces his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus talks about his love for us. Jesus talks about his care for us. He tells us how much we are worth, and he tells us that he died for us. He explains how he's longed for millenniums for us to be with him in heaven. You and I sit there. We've never felt so loved, so accepted. We've never felt so valued. Every corner of our heart is filled with his grace. Every corner of our heart is filled with his love. The Bible says, Revelation 22, verse 4, they shall see his face and his name shall be on their foreheads. They shall see his face. We fall at the feet of Jesus. And with the angels and the redeemed, we we sing worthy, worthy, worthy. It's the lamb to be slain who's been slain forever and ever and ever. We sing praises to his name. When we're leaving that church that day, in my imagination, Jesus taps me on the shoulder and says, Mark, I want to go for a walk with you. And you will have your special walk with Jesus. I'll have mine. In all eternity, he has time for you. And in your imagination, in my imagination, we're walking with Jesus. And as we walk with Jesus, we see magnificent flowers. And he says, do you see those flowers? I made them just for you. We walk through fields of waving grain, and he bends over and picks up a kernel of grain. He says, taste it. I know your taste buds. I made that grain just for you. It's the only variety like it in the world. There is no other. And as we walk with Jesus, he says, you see that, those flowers? I had the angels plant them on the hillside just for you. And he says, I long for you to be here so much. I've given you all the gifts of eternity. They are yours And Jesus says, is there anything else that I can do to make you happy? And I fall at his feet. And with tears running down my feet, my face, hold his feet and say, Jesus, all I want is you. I don't need the flowers in the field. I don't need the grain. Lord, all I need is you. Your love is enough for me. I don't need the mansion over there on the hill. That's a bonus. I don't need the gardens over there. That's a bonus. But Jesus... All I want to do is worship you because your love has filled every need in my heart and I know that this is eternity. I fall at his feet and I say, holy, holy, holy. I bowed on my knees and I cried holy because for me and for you, God has an eternal plan, a plan that I don't want to miss, a plan that you don't want to miss, healthy bodies, abundance, Jesus, love, peace, freedom from disease, eternity forever. Why not right now in your heart say, Lord, through your grace, I'm not going to miss eternity. Now listen. As Charles and Jennifer sing, I bowed on my knees and cried holy. I dreamed of a 
city called glory it was so bright and so fair as I entered the gates The scene was changed, no earth there seemed to be. I saw the holy city beside a tidal sea. The light of God was on the street, and the gates were open wide. And all who would might enter, and no one was denied. Of a moon and the stars by night, of a sun to shine a light. It was the new Jerusalem that would not pass away. It was a new Jerusalem that would not. Sing it together, Jerusalem. Let's stand together. We'll sing wherever you are tonight. Join us in singing.
We're going to pray. As we pray tonight, wherever you are, is the Spirit of God touching your heart? Maybe you've drifted away. God's calling you back tonight. Maybe you've been hesitating and you're about ready to make a decision to be baptized. God is calling you tonight. Here in Orlando, if God is calling you, I'm going to pray for you tonight. You've drifted away. You may not need to be rebaptized, but you want to come back to Jesus. If there's some sin in your life, you want to deal with it tonight, you're going to say, Lord, I'm surrendering that thing to you. If you sense God is calling you to baptism tonight, you want to say, Lord, I want to make a commitment. I have an appeal for three groups of people, and I just want you to raise your hand if you're in one of those groups. First, if you have made a decision that you want to follow Jesus and be baptized, you want to look forward to that. I want to pray for you tonight. Wherever you are, you're standing in some church. You are watching in some home. God sees your hand. You're here in Orlando. You want to look forward to our baptism on December 6th or a baptism in one of our churches this month or a baptism in January. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Just lift your hand up. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God sees these hands. God knows these hearts. Tonight, if you've drifted away and you say, Lord, I have to come back to you, I want to just lift my hand. I want to come back, Jesus. I've drifted away. God bless you. God bless you. You're saying, I want to come back wherever you are tonight. Thirdly, tonight, if there's somebody that you have some problem in your life, some habit in your life that's just holding you from a complete decision for Jesus, and you want to say, Lord, I'm surrendering that habit to you just now. I'm surrendering that sin to you just now. I want to be in heaven. Just raise your hand tonight. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. We're going to pray. Father in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his love. Thank you for his grace. Thank you for his power. Oh, Lord, we love you with all our hearts. We want to be in heaven. We don't want to miss that. Father, move on our hearts deeply. As we consecrate ourselves to you, we look forward to being with you through all eternity. In Christ's name, amen. Be seated, please. I just want to tell you how much I deeply appreciate the opportunity of being here with you in Orlando. We look forward to seeing you, many of you, next week from Dece on December 6th, from the 4th to the 6th. We will look forward to that. Satellite audience, God bless you as well. And we pray that you will find, day by day, a sweet fellowship with Jesus till he comes again. God bless you all. Thank you.